Hello all, welcome back to engineering economic course. Uh, course. We were discussing the cost estimation techniques. In our previous lecture, uh, we learned the price indexes, the indexing method, and the unit technique to estimate the costs, to estimate the costs. In today's lecture, we will learn an extension of the unit technique, which we will call as the factor technique. And then we will discuss parametric cost estimating methods. Simply, uh, basically, we will learn two methods uh, here, the power sizing technique and the learning curve techniques. And we will solve several examples and we will conclude chapter three by this lecture. So let's get started. Another cost estimation technique that we will discuss is the factor technique. This technique is an extension of the unit method. Remember the unit method from our previous discussion. Uh, in the unit method, we um, estimate the cost by using a per unit factor. For example, if you want to construct an apartment, a building, then we have, <coughs> we consider the per unit uh, cost or per square meter cost of uh, construction. And then using this, if you want to establish a 1000 square foot of building, you simply multiply uh, this 1000 with the per unit cost. In the factor technique, um, we simply extend this for products uh, of several quantities. So we may have several quantities, which is this part actually. We multiply the per unit of one component with the number of units in this component. Okay, Fm is the cost per unit of component M. And then Um is the number of units of component M. So this part simply is the extension of the unit method for to a number of different components. And then maybe there are some other components uh, for which the cost can be estimated directly. So this CD represents the uh, cost of the component D, which is estimated directly. So in total, um, the total cost of an item or a product that is being estimated is equal to the directly estimated components, the costs of directly estimated components, plus the costs uh, of the components that are estimated uh, using their per unit costs. Okay, so again, uh, an example uh, will be easier to uh, understand. Uh, suppose that uh, we need to estimate uh, the cost of a house with, with uh, 2,000 square feet of uh, total area. And this house will include two ports and a garage. Okay, now let's try to estimate this. The per unit uh, factor of constructing a house, let's say, is $85 per square foot. And remember, we are going to construct a 2000 square feet house. So simply the total cost will be the multiplication of 85 with the number of units. Okay. But we also, we are going to construct two porches and for which the cost is estimated directly. And it's said that per one porch, the cost is 10,000. And since we are going to construct two porches, it's two times 10,000. And we will also construct a garage and its cost is estimated to be $8,000. So in total, the total cost of constructing this house is 10,000 times two, which is the cost of porches, plus 8,000, which is the cost of the garage, plus 85 times 2,000, which is the cost of 2,000 square feet of house, which in total gives us 198,000. So this technique uh, is useful 
especially useful when the complexity of the estimating situation does not require a work breakdown structure, but several different parts are involved. Okay, we can use this method efficiently. So please read example uh, number 3.5 in your book uh, for better understanding. We can use parametric cost estimation, uh, especially in the early stages of the uh, project, to get an idea on how much the product uh, will cost on the basis of one or more design variables. Parametric cost estimation thing is the use of historical cost data and statistical techniques to predict future costs. Okay. So one method that we can use, for example, is the linear regression. So we can develop such uh, models uh, and to develop cost estimating relationships, which we call CERs, cost estimation relationships, uh, between the parameters such as the floor space, gross weight, ho uh, horsepower, and etc., the size, uh, between these design variables and the cost. And the output of the parametric models, uh, which is a uh, cost, estimated cost, is used uh, to gauge the impact of design decisions on the total cost. We will talk about two uh, parametric cost estimating methods. The first one is the power sizing technique and the other one will be the learning curve. In power sizing technique, we simply consider uh, one design parameter and its relationship with the cost. Uh, so for example, we can use this uh, technique uh, for developing capital investment estimates for plants and equipment. And what is the idea? Let's assume that you have a plant, let's say plant B, with size SB, and it has a cost CB. Okay? This size of plant has a cost of CB. Now, if we want to establish another plant, which is plant A, let's say, with uh, which has a size SA, then the ratio between these sizes of B and A should be equal to the ratio of the costs between B and A. But if this relationship is satisfied, we say that there is a linear relationship between the size and the cost. But in many cases, there is no such linear relationship. And simply, there is a power factor that relates the ratio of the size to the ratio of cost. And this X is called the cost capacity factor, which reflects the economies of scale between the design parameter, which can be the size, weight, horsepower, anything, uh, to the cost. And if we want to estimate the uh, cost of plant B, let's say, we simply multiply this CA over here and we get the relationship. Of course, if we want to estimate the cost of A, uh, simply we multiply the cost of B with the ratio of SA divided by SB to the factor of this X. Here, the cost capacity factor X, if it is equal to 1, as I told previously, this means that there is a linear relationship. But sometimes this factor is less than 1. If it is less than 1, it means that there is a, a decreasing economies of scale. So it means that um, the per unit uh, cost uh, the additional unit of capacity costs less than the previous unit. Okay, So this is what decreasing economies of scale means. In some cases, this x is 
greater than 1 so when you add one more unit for example when you increase the size by one additional unit its effect on the cost will be uh, higher than the previous addition the previous unit uh, so it is the increasing uh, economies of st uh, scale for better understanding this example will be helpful assume that there is an aircraft manufacturer that desires to make a preliminary estimate of cost of building a 600 megawatt fossil fuel plant uh, for the assembly of its new long distance aircraft okay it's known that a 200 megawatt plant costs of 100 million dollars 20 years ago when the appropriate cost index was 400 and the cost index now is 1200 uh, the cost capacity factor for a fossil fuel power plant is 0 0.79 actually in this example there are two things that we need to consider the first thing is the size so we uh, want to develop or establish a facility with 600 megawatt fossil uh, fuel plant and uh, we know the cost for 200 megawatt this is the first thing the size is different but there is also another factor which means that we know the cost of 200 megawatt plant for 20 years ago not for today so it means that first we need to calculate how much this 200 megawatt plant would cost now and then we need to uh, find uh, what will happen if we increase the size or the capacity from 200 to 600 okay so let's first do the first task i mean we want to establish or we want to calculate the cost of 200 megawatt plant cost of 200 megawatt plant now how do we find it of course using this indexing technique the indexes are given so 20 years ago when the cost index was uh, let's say 400 it would cost 100 million dollars and now the cost index is 1200 and what would it cost now simply the cost of this plant let me write cost of 200 plant now will be equal to 1200 times 100 million I'm not right million I'm not writing million there divided by 400 simply it should cost 300 million and this is the cost now okay uh, but this is the cost of a plant with 200 megawatt capacity and we need to find the 600 me megawatt uh, plant capacity so simply the cost of 600 let's say divided by cost of 200 will be equal to the size of 600 divided by size of 200 but there is a cost capacity factor which is given as 0 0.79 and simply if we plug in the values uh, of the sizes it's 600 divided by 300 to the power 0 0.79 and this cost over here we calculated it to be 300 million dollars and we if we multiply this over here the cost of this 600 megawatt capacity plant will be equal to after this uh, calculation uh, 714 million dollars okay so what we did we first calculated the cost of a 200 megawatt plant capacity uh, now using the indexing method 
and then using the uh, power uh, factor technique, power sizing technique, we uh, find or we estimated the cost of a 600 megawatt plant uh, from uh, or using the cost capacity factor. So we already solved this problem. This is the solution. As a summary, we first calculated the cost of 200 megawatt capacity plant uh, now, and then using that together with the size ratio uh, to the power uh, of cost capacity factor, we calculated the cost of a 600 megawatt capacity uh, as $714 million. Uh, the second parametric cost estimating technique that we will learn is the learning curve uh, technique, learning and improvement technique. Um, this basically, the idea of learning curve comes from reality. When you uh, are learning something the first time or doing a task for the first time, it takes more time for you. But when you repeat it for the second time, it would be faster. You would uh, complete the task uh, faster and quickly. When you do the repeat the same thing the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, you will obtain experience, you will learn it, you will learn how to do it, and it will be faster. But the thing is, how much will it be faster? This increase in your speed or efficiency will reduce from time to time. So the reduction in the second repetition from first one to the second one, the reduction in the completion time or will be uh, higher than the reduction from the second time, uh, second repetition to third repetition. And it will be less in from the third one to the fourth one. And simply, if we sketch a graph of your completion time with respect to the number of repetitions, okay, this is the number of repetitions, and this is, uh, let's say, the time to complete the task, for the first repetition, maybe it will take this much time. But for the second repetition, it will take this much time. So you will learn and uh, you will do it more quickly. For the third repetition, it will take maybe this much time. Again, you will learn. But here, the reduction from the first repetition to the second one and when you compare this reduction over here, this one is larger than this one. And when you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, you will see that the reduction, the learning effect will reduce. And you will obtain such a curve. This is called the learning curve. Okay. So the learning curve is a mathematical model that explains the phenomenon of increased worker efficiency and improved organizational performance with repetitive production of goods or services. This is the idea. And uh, it says that, uh, or let me say in this way, most learning curves are based on the assumption that a constant percentage reduction occurs in, uh, for example, uh, let's say labor hours, as the number of units produced is doubled. For example, uh, let me give you an example. If uh, in order to produce one product, uh, if 100 labor hours is required, this is the uh, number of hours for the first product okay and let's assume that uh, there is a 90 percent learning curve then when we double this output which means that for the second product the time to complete will be reduced to 90 percent of the initial one okay which will be 90 hours then when we double this product, the third one, the fourth one, when we double it, okay, uh, again there will be a 
90% uh, reduction from this one to here. So 90 times 90% reduction, which will be 81. But actually this 90 is equal to 100 times 0 0.9. So it means that it will be 100 times 0 0.9 to the power 2. And when we double this 4 to the 8, the 8 one that we produce, the time will again uh, will be doubled. And it means that this will be 0 0.9 to the power 3, which will be 72.9 hours. Okay, so to, com to uh, do the processing of the first part, it will be 100 hours. The second one will be 90 hours. The fourth one will be 81 hours. The eighth one will be 72.9 hours. So at each, when we double the production, when we double the repetition, uh, the uh, time, the necessary time, uh, reduces by a constant percentage. This is the idea behind the learning curve. We can use this equation over here to calculate the necessary time uh, for producing the outputs. Here, as you can see, this Z U, which is the number of input resources, resource units needed to produce output unit U. For example, if you want to produce the second product. So this U is 2 now. We are trying to produce the second product. Okay, when we say Z2, this is the second product. And the number of input resources, this input resource, as in this example, it can be the total hours or sometimes uh, the total um, what labor and etc. But usually it is in terms of hours. Okay, so this Z2 will be equal to this K, the number of input resource units needed to produce the first output unit. Okay, in this example, the first output unit, we have 100. Okay, this K is 100, which is the time needed for the first input unit. Uh, multiplied by, okay, it is, it says U, which is the output of unit number. So, for example, if uh, we are calculating the second unit, then this will be 2 to the power n. But what is this n? n is the logarithm s divided by logarithm of 2. And what is this s? This is the learning curve slope parameter expressed as a decimal. So in the example that I gave you, I said that uh, there is a reduction of 90% when the number of units is doubled. This 90% represents the slope and we don't represent it as 90% but we represent it as 0 0.9. Okay, So n is logarithm of 0 0.9 divided by logarithm of uh, 2. This denominator is always 2 and we place this n as a power in this equation. Okay, so this equation simply by using this equation we can calculate the amount of time or the amount of resources that is necessary to produce the youth uh, unit. This is the equation for the learning curve. Let's solve this example from your book to uh, understand this learning curve concept better. Um, let's, uh, the example says that the mechanical engineering department has a student team that's designing a formula car for national competition. The time required for the team to assemble the first car is 100 hours. Okay. There, so what is this? While reading this, if it's better if you can identify what the given data is. And remember, the uh, formula that we learned for the learning curve is z u is equal to k times u to the power n. And what is this 
100. It is the time to assemble the first car, which means that it is the value of k. Okay. Uh, their improvement or learning rate is 0 0.8, which means that as output is doubled, their time to assemble a car is reduced by 20%. Re reduction by 20% means that we are multiplying. So, for example, Z1 is 100. So, if we want to calculate Z2, it will be 100 times 0 0.8. Okay, it reduces by 20%, so it reduces to 80. Then Z4 will be equal to 80 times 0 0.8, which means it will be 64. And you can go in this way. But how will you calculate Z3? How will you calculate Z5, Z6, Z7? So here, if it is just doubled to 2, to 4, and to 8, we just use this multiplication. But what about Z3? And in order to calculate Z3, actually, we need to use this formula over here. And this 0 0.8, what is the 0 0.8? Uh, it is S, okay? S is 0 0.8. Then from here, we can calculate N as the logarithm of 0 0.8 divided by logarithm of 2. And it means uh, that this n is equal to minus uh, 0 0.322. This is n. Okay, in this formula, now we know k, we know n, and this u is the number of the unit. Then, I guess we can uh, calculate many things from here. Let's have a look at part a of the question. It says that calculate or determine the time it will take for the team to assemble the tenth car. Okay, let me write here A. We are asked to calculate this Z10. And if we write the formula over here, Z10 is equal to K, which is 100 times U, which is 10, to the power n, which is minus 0 0.322, as we calculated before. And it means that this is uh, 47.6 hours. Okay, So the first one requires 100 hours. The tenth one requires 47.6 hours. Okay, in part b of the question, we are asked to determine the total time required to assemble the first 10 cars. Okay, what does it mean? We need to calculate Z1 plus Z2 plus up to Z10, the cumulative time, all uh, times necessary to complete these. And remember the formula, Z1 is equal to K, Z2 is equal to K times uh, 2 to the power n z3 uh, is equal to k times two, uh, 3 to the power n and the tenth one is equal to k times 10 to the power n okay so simply we can take this in under k parenthesis write this under k parenthesis it will be equal to 1 plus 2 to the power minus we calculated this already, plus 3 to the power 0.322 and up to 10 to the power minus 0.322. Okay, and when you do this calculation, simply you will find 631 hours. What is this? This is the total time to complete 10 products. Of course, the first one uh, requires the largest amount, which is 100. The second one, this is Z1, remember. The second one requires 80. The third one, the fourth one, the tenth one we calculated is to be 47.6. Uh, and this calculation is equal to, this addition is equal to 631 hours. 
And the last part of the question, part C, it says that calculate the estimated cumulative average assembly time for the first 10 cars. What does it mean, uh, the average time? Actually, it is the total time that we calculate in this way divided by the number of uh, items that we are producing. So this is the average time to produce one part uh, for the first 10 cars. And simply this value is equal to 631 that we calculated divided by 10, which is 63.1 hours. This is the average time to produce one car for the first 10 production. And of course, remember, the first one takes longer, the last one takes shorter, but the average time is in between these two values. This is the solution that we already did in part A. We found it in that the tenth part would take 47.6 hours. In part B, we calculated the total time to produce the first 10 cars as 631 hours. And in part C of the question, we calculated the average time to be 63.1 hours. This is how we can solve this by hand. But actually, especially in this calculation, as you can see, you need to do a lot of calculation with your calculator. But you can make use of Excel, the spreadsheets, to solve these kind of problems efficiently. And in Excel, simply you write the formula to different cells. So the first part, the K is 100. We identified it. We identified that S is 80%. And from here, the N is calculated by simply dividing the logarithm of this S to the logarithm of 2. So in this cell, we write this formula, logarithm of B2 divided by logarithm of 2. And this is N. And then, uh, we write the number of units. These are U's, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10. Then we write the unit time to each one of these cells. And the unit time is simply K. K is written in cell B1 uh, multiplied by U. U is 1 for this first row to the power N. N is written in cell B4. And when you drag it down, you can calculate the unit time to calculate, uh, compute each one of these uh, or assemble each one of these cars. The first one is 100. When we double it, the time reduces by 20%. When we double it, the time reduces by, uh, sorry, 80%, uh, the time reduces by 20%, yes. Uh, and also, you can calculate the third one, fifth one, and etc. using the formula. You can calculate the cumulative time to uh, complete each one of them by adding the individual times up to that point. So for the 10th car, the cumulative total will be uh, 631. And you, we can sketch the graph of this one. As you can see, this solid line shows the unit time. And the unit time reduces uh, in a nonlinear way. Uh, this is the classical learning curve. Always the learning curve, shape of a learning curve is something like this. This dashed line over here shows the cumulative average time. Okay, So the first one, uh, there's only one part which takes 100 hours and the average is 100. But when we produce the second one, the unit time reduces to, let's say, this is 100. The unit time reduces to 80, whereas the average is 100 plus 80 divided by 2, which is 90. So the average time is larger. For the third one, the unit time reduces to 70.21, but the average is 100 plus 80 plus 7. Uh, 70.21 divided by 3, which is 83.4, which is larger than this value. 
Okay, the cumulative average also reduces, but it reduces less than the unit time itself. Okay, this uh, is how we can utilize or use spreadsheets to calculate these unit curves, uh, learning curves. So let's summarize what we have learned in this chapter. This is the end of the chapter. Uh, we will not cover the rest of the material in this chapter. What we have learned, we said that um, we know that developing a cash flows for each alternative, so we will compare alternatives with each other. And for each of these alternatives, we need to have cash flows. But since these cash flows will occur in the future, we don't know what will happen uh, in the future. There are a lot of uncertainties, but we need to develop these cash flows. And it is very important. It's a pivotal step in engineering economic analysis procedure. In order to develop these cash flows, we learned an integrated approach. And according to this integrated approach, we need to determine the length of the analysis period. We need to fix a perspective and determine a baseline. So the perspective usually is usually the owner's perspective. Uh, a work breakdown structure definition of the project is important. Uh, a cost and revenue structure we need to uh, define. And remember, for these cost and revenue categories, usually the included costs are the capital costs, operating costs, maintenance costs, material costs, labor costs, and the revenues resulted from the sales and the market value at the end of the lifetime. And we learned different estimating techniques or models uh, that we can use to estimate the future costs. So this is the end of the chapter that we will learn uh, and, and we will continue uh, in the next chapter by learning a very important concept. Uh, it is one of the fundamental concepts of engineering economy, which is the time value of money.